Well, like it or not, Australia right now is rapidly moving down the path of the energy transition. Then the question of whether we should embark on a nuclear power industry will become a debating point into the next federal election. Perhaps a bigger question for the government is where Australia will get all the people to build the poles, the wires, the solar farms, wind farms, batteries, pumped hydro and geothermal energy projects into the future. And that's even before we start thinking about nuclear. The risk for Australia is an energy hole where we don't build enough quickly to overcome the gap caused by closing the coal-fired power stations. Well, this week I spoke with Romilly Madhu, formerly the head of Infrastructure Australia, now Chief Executive of Engineers Australia. The Federal Government released a report last year on the skills that we need to reach uh, net zero by 2050, and we actually need two million additional workers, a lot of them are engineers, but also technicians and other workers in clean energy by 2050. So how are we going to get there and get these workers? We have a lot of these workers in our workplace at the moment, but they're not necessarily in, you know, have the skills or capacity that we need. So we need to identify them and reskill them and retrain them. But the other challenge we have is we have massive skills gaps. Uh, we, we have capacity holes and we have a leaky pipeline when it comes to engineering. And what that means is we don't have enough homegrown born engineers to focus both on energy transition and then all the other national priorities that we have. So does this slow down and hinder the rollout of that energy transition? Because that creates, if you like, a gap in energy supply in Australia, which creates vulnerabilities for the Australian economy. So under, understanding the energy transition workforce is critically important. And I know workforce planning is underway, but also understanding that gap. Uh, so what do we need and where are we going to get them from? So part of that also is, are our universities and our TAFE systems teaching the right skills for the skills we need in the future? And then also, what is the gap and where are we going to get those people from? Secondly, we know we're never going to fill that gap. There's just, it, it's, there's just too many people. We know we're not going to fill it. So what the next part of that story is, is the use of technology, AI, robotics, deep tech, and what is that going to fill? So I'll just give you a simple one. If you've got an engineer who spends 100% of their time working on um, uh, signalling or tunnelling for you know, part of clean energy, if we can relieve them of the administrative burden of when they're just sitting on spreadsheets and some of the menial and admin tasks that they have using AI or digital, that means we've got that engineer focusing on engineering and increasing the percent of their time in engineering. So we also need to be looking not just at the skills uplift we need in clean energy, it's also how does digital and technology fit and support and enable the clean energy transition that we're going through. And that's without even going to what is clearly going to be an election debate issue, and that is the whole notion of rolling out a nuclear industry in Australia. Now, Australia already has Lucas Heights, which means we have certain engineers and certain skilled people working there, but that's not enough if we're now going to decide that we're going to embark on creating electricity using nuclear fission. So when it comes to nuclear, with the AUKUS announcement uh, that occurred, we're already looking at our uplifting our nuclear engineering capability. So that is in play with the defence lens on it. So does that come through our universities? Where do those people actually come so from? So it comes through universities, but it's, it's, it's an immature market in Australia and it needs to be a maturing market. So we know for a fact that if you look at the US or the UK, they have a mature nuclear engineering market. Australia doesn't. It has a, a you know, it's a market that is transitioning uh, through AUKUS. And so we need to create areas of practice, community of practice, a whole level of skills. Because one of the key things about nuclear is safety is critical. So A, you need to learn about nuclear and, how, and the engineering around nuclear, but then you also need to learn other elements that fit within nuclear. And safety and security and the sensitivity of it is critically important. So even before we can talk about nuclear energy, we're still looking at uplifting on our engineers just for AUKUS as it is. So again, you can see that there will be, there are skills gaps and a lot of learning that we need to do in uplifting um, engineering to be able to understand and take on uh, nuclear as an area. Okay, because part of the debate that would suggest we should not have a nuclear electricity generation industry here is the time it will take to build it out. 
Uh, and then the next aspect that you raise is trying to train up your people so that you can actually run those plants safely. That's going to be, if you like, a significant impediment if Australia were ever to make a decision that nuclear is on the table. That's correct. When you're looking at an engineer, you can't just say, oh, I want a nuclear engineer. You know, they need to work for over 10 years. They would have studied for four to six years, and then they need to become a subject matter expert in whatever that field might be. But just say it's a 10-year learning on, on, on that area. Uh, and then they become considered, would be considered a chartered engineer in, in their specific area. Uh, so overnight, we can't just say we need uh, a 1,000 nuclear engineers. It doesn't work that way. It's like if you're a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, it takes years of learning and experience to be seen then as, you know, a professional uh, engineer in that area. So not only that, they need to be trained up front in how you build, design uh, and operate nuclear, uh, and that's years away. Okay, but because we have insufficient engineers in so many different categories in Australia, but specifically in um, the renewable energy space, plus also in this nuclear energy space, does that compromise, do you think, even our net zero emissions targets into the future? We need to focus on our competitive advantage in Australia and really focus on those areas in clean energy where we know we have the capability already. Uh, so putting nuclear to one side, we know we have capability in wind, uh, in uh, household solar, in batteries and in the technology that sits behind that. And there's been a lot of work done in this area and case studies all over Australia. So if we focus on those areas, but then also focus on skilling up, we should be able to meet our targets. We've been under pressure before in other areas and we've been able to uh, increase the workforce. We have all those workers in thermal energy already, so in coal and gas. And there's no reason why we cannot transition those workers across. There's also no reason why we can't bring engineers who, have, who haven't been working. They may have been caring or have left the field. There's no reason why we can't retrain them and bring them back in. And there's no reason why we can't uh, bring in those migrant engineers who are here in Australia at the moment and who are not working in clean energy. And there's no reason why we can't bring them in and also skill them up. We should be able to meet our targets if we really focus on skills and capability. Is one of the big impediments to all these targets, to whatever it might be, that the vast majority of engineers in Australia are men? How, that's a great... <laughs> I think one of the challenges we have in Australia is we're not attracting over 50% of the workforce being women. Uh, only 16% of our working engineers are female and of that 16%, 3.8% of them are born in Australia. We need to attract more women into engineering. Uh, you know, there's huge potential there. So why don't we? Oh, there's cultural reasons, uh, if you, and there's bias reasons. If you look at uh, girls in school, uh, the schools don't uh, advocate the importance of maths and science. Parents, teachers and, and career advisors uh, don't advertise and advocate on behalf of engineering. There's so many wonderful potential roles in engineering, and all the amazing females I meet in engineering are remarkable, but we need thousands more of them. Uh, so there's, there's the issues of school, there's the issues of young girls don't know what engineering means. Uh, so they look at the other, you know, they might, they know what a doctor is and they know what an accountant is and a lawyer is, but we want them to know what a, a, an engineer is. You know, we really do want everyone to find their inner engineer and there's an opportunity to do that. You know, we have the ability and we have this, the, um, the intellectual uh, grunt in Australia to bring them into engineering, but it's really attracting and retaining them in engineering. Romilly Madhu, always good to chat to you. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ross.